Remember how I did Shadow Warrior? Yeah, see, Shadow Warrior is a good game. Blood is better. I can't overstate how much I love Blood. I probably already did, but that was set against Blood 2, and Blood 2 is a poor introduction to the series that Blood 2 killed. Blood is one of the best first-person shooters ever created. Like, in terms of where I would put it, it's way more fun than Half-Life. Sure, it doesn't rewrite how narrative is presented in first-person shooters, and it's not as important as Doom, but... It's majestic, a delicacy of action gaming. The best game on the build engine, the holiest of the holy trinity. Hallowed be its name. Everything Duke and Shadow Warrior did, Blood did better. The atmosphere, the art direction, the action, everything. But it's also the hardest. Yeah, Shadow Warrior was hard. Blood is much, much harder. So hard that I'm not playing on the highest skill, which is extra crispy. That skill is meant for co-op, and I tried. I really tried. Here's where I got to. Let's go. And here's what most of getting there looked like. Take it, man. And here's the pill for the therapy I needed to recover from it. And here's the therapist who tried to help me. So we're doing this on Well Done, and if you're worried that it's not hard enough, you haven't played Blood. I've never beaten this on Well Done. Lightly Broiled is like Shadow Warrior's hardest skill, and Well Done is harder, and Extra Crispy is like playing a casual game of Minecraft while, while being, being set, set on fucking fire. fire! Subtle differences between these skills. On Lightly Broiled, Blood's normal skill, cultists throw sticks of dynamite at you. On Well Done and Extra Crispy, cultists throw bundles of dynamite at you. The enemy reaction time gets lower and lower to the point where an extra crispy, as soon as you're in the enemy's field of view, you know immediately because one of two things happens. One, the screen becomes a bright red color, or two, you're dead. That's not to say the whole game is like that, because it only starts being like that maybe a third of the way through the first level. Oh, and we're using Blood GDX because democracy. Swear to God, I thought you guys would pick DOSBox just to fuck with me. I know, I know, the lighting and the color and the shading is different in DOSBox with the software renderer, but Blood GDX plays the game in widescreen 1080p, a stable frame rate, not terrible mouse aiming, and also I don't have to worry about that weird difficulty glitch where if you load a game, right, what happens is the damage from the enemies changes in this weird way. I don't know how this happens, I don't know why it happens. I'm just a regular Joe who plays video games on the internet, obsessed with the minutia of how a two-decade-old non-3D game engine works. Well done it is. I live. Again. Not for long. Unlike in Blood 2, you're not defenseless. Blood's weapons are mostly incredibly powerful. So there's two secrets in the first room. Some flares in here, and more importantly, dynamite. Don't even attempt to play through blood on a medium or high skill without learning how to toss dynamite. Hold down the fire button, keep it pressed if you want to throw it further. Don't hold it forever because it's burning down and you will die. Remember that Pro Wang episode where I talked about using grenades to shoot around corners to clear out suspicious rooms? TNT can work the same way. Now, primary fire won't bounce off a wall like a grenade, but secondary will. If you don't find that secret in the first room, you obviously didn't pay attention to the demo because it's in there. You get practice immediately because you get two zombies as soon as you exit the tomb. A well-placed dynamite bundle can kill them both. Pitchforking can take longer, but once you get the rhythm down, you're golden. Sometimes you'll need to save ammo by doing this which you'll see later, you know, until that's not an option anymore. Also, crouching, it matters. Unlike in Duke 3D and Shadow Warrior, and most FPS games now that I think about it, where crouching was mainly used for accessing ventilation shafts, in Blood, the hit-scanning enemies have a harder time hitting you if you're crouched. So if you're lucky, you'll have a few weapons by the end of the first level. Pitchfork, dynamite, and a flare gun. Primary fire shoots a flare, obviously. It sticks to an enemy and burns them. If it burns them enough, they get set on fire and they run around screaming. It's awesome. Now, when well done, your average zombie needs to be shot twice with the flare gun. Or you can cheat it by sticking them a couple of times to get their health down. If you have the ammo, the flare gun secondary fire shoots eight flares out in a diamond pattern. It is also awesome. If you're lucky, one of the cultists will drop a shotgun for you. It's one of the finest shotguns ever put into a video game. A sawed-off double barrel that Caleb reloads as fast as a gunslinger should, which is faster than most games' pump-action shotguns. One well-placed hit with both barrels kills any cultist, probably a zombie too. 
This room in the funeral home will kill you the first time on a harder skill. I took a weird route inside at the beginning by going through a window and getting straight to the furnace room. This allows you a little more leeway in dealing with the bastards waiting for you in the main area. Once you jump on that altar, you get attacked by rats. Rats are awful. Tiny, hard to hit, will deal melee damage before you do and take like five hit points off. It's crazy. So here's a million of them getting blown up. Then there's a super secret in the first level where you can get the napalm launcher, which is ludicrously overpowered, but so are your enemies, we'll get to that. Not every map has a super secret, but when they do, they have great shit in them, and you'll see a few of them in this video. On top of the mausoleum right at the beginning is the gun's akimbo power-up, but you can't really appreciate it right now because all you have is a flare gun. Unless you got really lucky like I did and picked up a shotgun. There's a couple secrets in the furnace room, a life seed in the furnace itself, which is 100 health points. Behind these barrels of corpses, there's a portable med kit. Get that, get it now, and bind it to a convenient key. There's also some flares if you pull down this saw. I'm taking the weird way into the funeral home, but I still want to show you how Caleb enters it. Open for business. You hear that? That's Stefan Waite being amazing. You're gonna hear a lot of that. Duke can be cringy, Lo Wang can be a racist caricature, but Caleb? who would be a total edgelord if voiced by someone else, is instead the raspy, gunsling, and undead maniac we all know and love. <laughs> a little on plot here, I've explained this before, but it's a quick refresher. Caleb meets Ophelia, falls in love, joins a cult that worships the dark god Chernabog, ascends to the high-ranking position of Chosen with a couple of other people, Ophelia, Gabriel, Ishmael, and then Chernabog has a bunch of monsters take the other Chosen while tossing you into the grave you wake up in at the start of episode one. I've taken your love. Now I will take your life. Consider my power in a hollow grave. I don't want to get more into it yet. This is a game about, well, the game. Wrong Side of the Tracks takes place mostly at a train station right next to the funeral home. Duck, dive, and make sure your aim is true, and toss that dynamite. Here's my favorite thing to do in the game, which is leading a crowd of axe zombies towards you, jumping back, tossing a bundle of TNT, and just barely escaping the splash damage. It's my favorite thing in any build engine game, but it takes mastery of the game's movement. It's a little floatier than Duke or Shadow Warrior. You kind of feel like you're bouncing around the way you land with the subtle sway of the camera. It doesn't give you the impression of realistic movement, it gives you the impression of action movie movement. It's weird sometimes, but it's such a fucking rush, I feel stupid for sitting here doing a voiceover for this video instead of playing it. No matter how this gets edited, it's more fun to play than watch. It's all in a subtle way your character's weapons and hands move and are animated. Here's the thing, right? I'm saving my napalm for right here. Watch this napalm launcher not only kill the cultist, not only kill the dipshit next to him, but also destroy the railing they're standing behind. I love it. Get ready, kids, because you're about to hit the wall. If you're not a rampaging death machine by this point, as in halfway through the second level, forget it. Play on still kicking, because you're done. Never underestimate the value of your flare gun's secondary fire, because you get a ton of flares, and clusters of hitscan enemies die in seconds. You might notice how low I am on health. That's normal. There's a secret life seed out this window. Take it. There's a secret in the kitchen in the cask of a Maniato grill where you get the invisibility power up and yes, you are completely invisible to monsters. And I always use this to breeze through a trap in this room here. The zombies and the cultists don't even notice that you're there even if you toss bundles of dynamite at them. Shit, I missed one of those zombies. But it gives me an opportunity to talk about dealing with zombies. Hear this sound? That sound means the zombie isn't dead. He's gonna come back. Hear this one? That's the one. He's down for good. Sound design, kids. And the way explosions work, uh... It's not just one static splash. You know, like in, like, Doom or Duke 3D, where it's just a cylinder. It's like an expanding sphere of damage that pushes things around. It's so much more dynamic than Shadow Warrior or Duke, but it's so fun. Explosions in this game have more weight than other build engine games. It's so 
Oh, it's so fucking good. Also, once this train comes in, walk down the tunnel here instead of exiting. Do it. It's good time. Now we're really into it. Phantom Express, the best train level in the Blood games. Get it? Because there's like four train levels in Blood 2 and they're all shit. Anyway, here's what I consider to be the first real absolute bloodbath in the game, the dining car. In the room before it, you get a Guns Akimbo power-up and a Life Seed. A room full of head scanners capped off with a ton of zombies? It'll take a few tries, but here's the thing. The satisfaction of conquering a brutally difficult room, not necessarily an unfair room if you understand the movement and the tools at your disposal. This is one of those levels that takes the real location in a primitive engine thing and runs with it. Everything happens on this train, and each car basically has two floors, so it's not an entirely linear map. Like when you reach the dining car in the back of the train, you get a key that opens the areas two cars ahead. You go upstairs, you see the kitchen and some other areas, and like I said, primitive, but it all fits together so well. Everything makes sense. Whoa. Oh, just me. Here's some private rooms. There's a storage compartment you can blow a giant hole into from the lower floor. Or you can just take the elevator. But don't, because it's cooler to toss dynamite up there. Before you blow up this train, which you do, because of course, there's another super secret in this level that requires you to be basically psychic. See this area on the map that's empty? The designers put a secret room there. It's full of very, very useful stuff. It's a bitch to get to because you have to jump off the train in order to get it. But then you open the door and... So even if you've cleared out the train, you still get to use your guns akimbo. The hits keep coming, another absolutely classic level. Full of carnival games, zombies, explosions, tricks, traps, and one giant battle inside of a tent with a pit of snakes in it. And here's what doing that battle correctly looks like. If I stop to talk about the intricate, awesome design of these levels, like the fact that you can still explore some of the train you just fucking crashed, this video would go on forever. You know how badly Blood 2 is designed? Blood 1, conversely, is designed so much better that it hurts. Here's the Reflective Shots power-up. I'm gonna show it to you now that I can actually get some use out of it. Reflective Shots is a creative, fun little item that makes enemies' attacks bounce off you and instead hit them. Even rats. I wish it showed up more, it's fun. You meet the gargoyle who takes a pounding from bullet weapons, but it's weaker to fire. The way it moves is a pain in the ass. I usually save napalm ammo just for them, because blowing them apart is super satisfying and setting them on fire is even more satisfying. Once you've cleaned out the carnival, you could go straight to hallowed grounds, but this is pro-blood, so we have to go to House of Horrors. Over the lips, through the gums, look out to me. Here I come. Welcome to the hardest level of episode one. Stuffed to the brim with enemies, there's even an unforgiving underwater section that I skipped by jumping past. <laughs> this underwater area is hell. All these zombies show up here, right, and they follow you underwater, along with a Tommy Gunner and all these bone eels, and you're way slower underwater, naturally. Just fuck this part, I don't care if you get a diving suit, you don't really need it much in this episode anyway. Be ready to die. A lot. Yeah, you need to crouch and toss explosives and bounce bundles of TNT around and use everything in your arsenal to its full potential. Kill everything. Especially the mimes. <laughs> if House of Horrors is the hardest level, it's only because they loaded it up with hit scanners and tight corridors. Hollowed Grounds is a little more generous. It's still a bitch to play. This is where episode one starts to slide for me because it gets very hard. Full of cultists, whole rooms of enemies that can kill you in a second flat if you're not quick and careful, and traps. Those jump boots saved my life here a couple of times. Press J to activate them and they drain as long as you're wearing them. So what I do is tap J, get the high jump, and then immediately tap J again to turn it off. Unless I have to negate any fall damage. Using the jump boots like this lets you make the most of every second you have them. Two portals, to certain death. Next is, uh, 
I forget what this level is called. It's the second temple level. Oh, yeah, the Great Temple. Okay. Hollow Grounds was a castle. This one is a temple. They're pretty similar. They're both hard as fuck. This one gave me a little more trouble because I was running low on ammo. Somehow this temple is above the clouds, and if you jump down with the jump boots on, you're still gonna die, but you can get this cool message. Dude, this is a totally deep hole. Yeah! This part might convince you to never jump into the clouds again, but a little later you do just that, a leap of faith, Yeah, I've only been playing this game for 20 years. This secret gives you most of the episode 1 weapons and power-ups. And super armor. Oh, I haven't even explained the armor system yet. Okay, so you get three types of armor. Basic armor, good against standard attacks. Spirit armor, good against magical attacks. And fire armor, which is self-explanatory. Super armor gives you 200 points of all of these. But now we're headed for the episode 1 boss. Shiog. Shiog. Kach? Kach. Is that Yiddish? A big stone gargoyle, but first, Stefan Waite needs to earn that paycheck. Ophelia? Oh. Show yourself! Show yourself! Yeah, it's a little heavier and better delivered than, say... I'll rip your head off and shit down your neck. Get yourself some jump boots, there's some at the bottom of the arena. Once the gargoyles come out, jump up there and you'll get a gun's akimbo power up and some ammo, you'll need it. There's a window on each side of the arena with a secret that'll give you the opportunity for full health and armor. You'll also need those. Fun fact, a boss's hit points go up a lot depending on the skill. On the easiest skill, he has a modest 2500 hit points. Then he jumps another 900. Then another 1700 more for lightly broiled. On well done, kick it up another 1200 points. So he has more than double the health on well done. And I noticed because I put everything into him. Maybe 80 shotgun shells, like 400 bullets, a few dozen flares, another 15 bundles of TNT, and I only died once. You can mostly circle strafe to avoid his attacks. Sleep, Ophelia. Caleb's not convinced, though, so when he's done burning his girl's body, he double taps to make sure. Hi kids, Sivvy again. If you didn't already leave once the credits started rolling, I appreciate it. And I want to give a shout out to my ever-growing list of patrons who keep me well-stocked in cigarettes and fentanyl. And for that, they saw this episode on Friday. If you'd like early access to episodes, you too can give a dollar a month on Patreon using the link in the description and your parents' credit card. There's other ways to see it early, but you'd have to be down here with us.